Wow, everybody's so cheery today. Um, I will try to keep you that way. Um, so again, I always start out by saying thanks for coming so early because I know it's arduous to, to get up this early. Um, I actually, the first thing I'm going to do after I leave here is go to bed because I didn't last night. Um, because I always do these, change these things to the last minute. Uh, so I don't have any funny family stories. First, a couple of questions just for you guys. Um, so who's been to this type of presentation before with me? Wow, cool. <laughs> okay, I'm not nervous anymore. Liar. Um, and um, just the, uh, out of curiosity, how many of you, raised, show of hands, millennials in the audience? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I won't talk too much crap about you. Um, Gen X? Okay, good. Wow. And boomers? Excellent. All right. Anybody above boomers? <laughs> Fucking liars. Um, okay, so this year, usually I tell a funny story about my family, but I really didn't have a whole lot. Um, so uh, there was a couple of things I wanted to share instead. The first was, uh, Kurt, if you want to roll it up, there was a um, comic that I saw, well, somebody actually sent it to me because it, it was so me that uh, they saw it, and I, I, I really wanted to share it because it's just perfect for, like, re it's this perfect reality check, and that's what today's kind of about. <laughs> I just love that. Um, so it's interesting. The audience is actually pretty well balanced, a little skewed towards boomers maybe, but that's appropriate for the only other little story I wanted to tell you. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking to a buyer uh, from a, a very large uh, U.S. company about this presentation. She said, uh, so are you going to talk about millennials again? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, millennials, what a bunch of assholes. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so funny. I thought it was perfect. Um, but uh, I promised I wouldn't say who she was, but I told her I was going to repeat that. Um, I think today, in sum, is really um, an order to simplify. You know, um, the, the next quote I want to I show you is, is sort of a, a knockoff for this. It's our kickoff, rather. Um, it's a quote by Albert Einstein. And I love it because it... It really addresses what we're trying to do today. There is so much noise about generational relevance. And I mean, I've been saying that for five years, so I obviously believe in that. But there's just a lot of noise. And sometimes it's just hard to have some sort of a simple formula that says, this is what I need to do. Somebody give me a roadmap to success or to innovation. So what my team and I tried to do um, was to put together something where we would do just that. So I'm just going to jump right in because there's a lot of stuff to share with you. So we called the session Back to Basics, The Essentials of Success. And when we're all sort of sitting around table, uh, I, I work on this project with a bunch of different trend forecasters and um, we kind of talk about what do we think? What really matters? And let's try to forget all the words that we already know, like SWOT analysis and pestle analysis and all of these different types of analyses and, and just say what matters most. Um, so focus was, we came up with five words. The first was focus. Um, the second was listen to the consumer, sort of action imperatives. The third is deliver more value. The fourth, enable creativity and experience. And then the fifth is engage in new ways. So they're mandates, they're challenges to yourself, um, and uh, we're just going to get right into them. The, I see a lot of people taking notes. All of this is available to you via web link. So after this presentation, within the next two days, um, you will see a link to the presentation on the IHA site, and, uh, or you can email me, and I'll make sure to get it to you personally. So we did an insight survey like we do every year. This year's Insight Survey, again, just to sort of give you an idea of who, was, uh, who replied to it, uh, was about 56% retailers, 19% wholesalers, and 25% manufacturers. And what we asked them, we asked them 10 questions, which I'll show you some of during the course of this. But the first was, which of the following makes you the most nervous about your 2015-16 business outlook? And number one um, 
by nearly a 10-point margin was consumer spending. Number two at 25% was the economy. And number three was competition. Pretty healthy, expected type of response. It was just interesting to see what was sort of forefront in people's minds. Um, so consumer spending in the economy obviously dovetail very, uh, you know, in inexorably. Um, so we're going to talk about that first in a way. Um, the first mandate of focus your strategy. You know, uh, we wanted to make a general sort of commentary to say, where's the economy going? You know, where, where do we stand today? Where do we look at standing? In, in all truth, things are looking fair, fair to, fair to middling. They're moving up. We're getting more comfortable. Um, the, it's not as fast as we would like or as voluminous as we would like. Um, but we're looking at uh, retail going up at about 4%, uh, 4.1% in 2015, excluding um, gas stations and restaurants. Um, if we look at 2015, gross domestic product is projected to come up about 3.3% from 2.4% in 2014, so that's good and healthy. Um, retail, like we said, will wind up about 4.1%. Unemployment is going to fall to a projected 5.3% by year-end 15. It's a wonderful thing for a lot of reasons, because obviously when unemployment goes down, and one of the reasons it's going down is millennials are finally like getting jobs that are starting to pay them more. Um, and, and you also are seeing uh, some Gen Xers that were the last sort of trickles of struggling with um, unemployment post-recession or getting back into positions and getting closer to making what they were when um, things ended. Uh, and then um, in housing, new single family starts and sales are up 25% in 15. Now there was a big fall off in the recession. So even with that 25%, you'll get a, a, a more extended version, but it's healthy. Very, it's, it's very positive. Housing expectations overall. Um, we look at um, the uh, existing home sales are projected to come up 7.4%. Median home prices are also going to rise 4%. That is actually good. We had some strong median home price rises last year, but those were actual selling prices. So that's a really good indication, especially in, uh, in late fall last year. We saw some solid pickups. Rents will increase 4%, and new home sales, oops, I'm sorry. New home sales uh, are looking to boost about 37%. Uh, there's no question that first-time buyers, um, that fall has definitely affected us, uh, but we're, we're starting to see ourselves wrestle our way out of that. And we can look at existing home sales again for some very positive indi indicators. Um, the percentage of first-time buyers climbed 31% in November 2013. That's the highest it's been, and it's, it maintained uh, through uh, the end of the year uh, through, uh, since October 2012, which is terrific. There are more typical buyer purchases and less investor purchases, which is great because those are the buyers that you have putting money into their homes, making improvements, their, their you know, either you know, families or, or, or the like. Also, 32% of the homes were on the market for less than a month. That's very positive. That means that they're not sitting out there, not selling. That was a real problem a couple of years ago. And finally, distressed home sales accounted for only 9% of sales in 2014. So again, good news. The median home price went up last year. Again, positive, especially since it crested over that $200,000 mark. Um, and uh, so those gains are very important to us. Um, there were some... Uh, changes to marriage. Marriage in general has, has suffered uh, as a result of the recession. So um, somebody said to me, the other, I was talking uh, to a group of, of buyers a few days ago and I said, you know, so they, they were all millennials. So we were talking about the facts and figures and I said, so why, why is marriage suffering? Why aren't you guys getting married? And this girl said, I can answer for the whole table because I'm not going to marry a guy who's still living with his parents, makes $28,000 a year, and doesn't have a steady job. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's romantic. Um, but <laughs> but it, it is definitely, look, that's, that's the way it is. Those are the numbers that we're looking at. Um, we, are, we do, though, have a lot of more multi-generational homes. Um, you know, there are new types of households that we have to look at and that we have to consider. Um, and that's especially important. When we look at multi-generational homes, like the boomerangers that we talked about and things like that. That's, you're dealing with expectations of multiple generations buying the same products that you're selling. 
Um, you know, lifestyle changes, again, there are a lot of reasons for changes in marriage. Um, a tremendous amount of cohabitation before marriage, uh, the recessions, financial fallout, you know, uh, definitely unemployment, underemployment has all fueled the wedding decline. But just to give you some of the numbers, uh, full year 2014 wasn't available, but full year 2013 is probably not all that far off. Um, average wedding cost about $25,000. Um, it's... Weddings are good because they're one of the times when people spend the most on, on gifts, uh, on showers, especially in housewares. Um, and uh, so we, we like to sort of keep those numbers up. The interesting thing is we tend to keep thinking about weddings as being sort of first weddings. But I wanted to shine a little bit of light on that because remarriage accounts for about 40% of weddings. So, you know, bad for romance, good for business. Um, <laughs> So this is the first year that the U.S. became a single majority, rather last year. 50.2% of all people over the age of 16 were not married. Um, and that, of course, creates some, some uh, changes in demand. But what we wanted to show here, and you should click on the video when you get the presentation, um, Alibaba in China did $9 billion off of a holiday called Singles Day which only two years ago was nominal. It used to be a holiday where, like, if you were single, you and your single friends got together and had a pity party and gave each other presents, okay? And Alibaba decided to turn it into this thing where I'm single, I'm going to buy myself some stuff because I deserve it. And they made a huge thing about it. It was all over the news. So click on the link. You can see that. I can't wait till it moves over here because now I just buy myself stuff because I want to. Um, no, I have an excuse. It's Singles Day. But it's, it's, it's a Black Friday type of equivalent in terms of the way it's promoted. Um, focus on omnichannel. We think focusing on omnichannel is really important because one of the big myths that's being busted about millennials is they still love to shop retail, partly from a social experience, but partly they're just... They want to touch and feel and, and try merchandise just like all of us do and experience it in an environment that where it's grouped together. So we definitely look at that. Um, just a positioning point. Um, the average consumer has about 10 different touch points for every purchasing decision, meaning they're looking at it online, they're seeing it in a store, they're reading ads, they're looking at it in magazines. Um, online purchases only represent 5% of all retail spending in the U.S. And even among shoppers who do that, 77% of them still go to a brick-and-mortar store to make an actual purchase. We also think that we should focus on social responsibility. Um, not just because it's what's right, um, but because everything is so transparent, we're incredibly visible. So um, the, one of the things that we look at is that brands are right now expected to take responsibility for things. And by brands, by the way, you'll see this throughout. But when I say brands, I mean, you're, I, it doesn't matter to me whether you're a, a freestanding small retailer or a midsize or a big chain or you're an actual brand. Uh, you still have to watch for all of these things because people are watching. Um, you know, just minimum wage issues, grassroots movements that have to do with the environment, uh, environmental issues, uh, community conditions, consumer privacy concerns. What are we doing with all the data that we collect from these people? Um, leveraging power among retailers, if you're a manufacturer, to make movement for change. Um, the Fortune 500 did a... Uh, a little uh, face, facing thing on this. And they said, brands have three choices. They can either do nothing and hope that you're not discovered, or you can take ownership and you can, you know, of the social and the environment and issues and make issues from the, straight out from the brand, or you can work with your competitors to tackle issues, make it their responsibility and determine between you who's going to do that. So, uh, you know, all very valuable. Um, we wanted to ask whether, you know, do you have a view on sustainability? It's not something I'm going to expect an answer on. But when you think of sustainability, there are really kind of three tiers to handle it, three ways to handle it. One, of course, is products. A lot of people do terrific products and handle sustainability that way. The second is strategies. Um, if you go to IKEA.com, uh, you can see their sustainability summary. It's a brilliant strategy, beautifully executed, you know, really beautifully followed up on. And then um, education. Unilever has mounted a 
wonderful education program across all of their products in the U.S. Um, they teach consumers about sustainable living. They've created rewards programs because they really believe that you're not going to do anything that doesn't reward you, and they're probably very right about that. So, um, because even, uh, even millennials, surprisingly, in terms of gross to net, the most action-oriented uh, generation is boomers. Um, so, I think it's because we feel so guilty. <laughs> so, one of the things that we asked in the Insight Survey was, which would your organization be most likely to support or promote? And again, health and wellness issues really topped it for us. I, it's, it's strange because usually health and wellness in, well, it's not strange, actually. It makes perfect sense because we're housewares. We have so much to do with health and wellness, things that come close to your body, things that you deal with every day. Um, so that's a very balanced answer for us, actually. Uh, for most other people, uh, uh, other industries, eco-responsible initiatives range between like mid-50s to like mid-60s in terms of this type of a question. So for this section, we said, okay, what are the essentials? What's, what's the toolkit? What are the essentials to innovation, really? Well, the first one is in an omnichannel world, you've got to be visible. Find a way. Plan it strategically. Because there are so many people. You'll see a, a stat later on on how many of the people who responded to the survey, which were all IHA members, um, how many of them said that they had no strategy whatsoever. Um, so that's very important. The second is discretionary income is limited. You have a very small window. You have no salespeople, unless you're very lucky and you have some great experts on the floor and you have just a small shop. But the vast majority of us don't have salespeople anymore, certainly not expert salespeople. So we really count on product packaging and other medium to tell the story of our product. The third is um, consumers are buying, making buying decisions faster. And they, as the economy gets better, we're going to get used to making those decisions faster as the, our ability to compare and contrast pricing and qualities and values as, as software improves, we'll be doing more of that as well. So make sure that you enable quick evaluation of your product. How are you doing that? Peer and multi-generational influencers are opening a lot of new markets. Um, and by that, we mean you will more often hear about products from friends and family, same way you hear about apps. You hear about them from other people a lot of times before you ever hear about them from a store or from the company themselves, especially in housewares. So it's important to make sure, that's another reason why social media is so important. Deliver complete solution-focused assortments. And by that we mean, whether you're a manufacturer, if you're producing a dish rack, be, be about sinkware. If you're, and, and you know, be the lifestyle of that. Be the lifestyle of cleaning an organization. If you're a retailer, don't just tell a story about juicing. What do I need for juicing? I need boards. I need cutlery. I need everything that goes along with that lifestyle. Because consumers shop in their head in lifestyles. They will buy less when they go running from department to department. Oh, I have to go over to cutlery because I need a cutting board for that, uh, you know, for my, for my juicer. And I need a new, a new fruit knife. Don't send them to three different places. Whatever, the, whatever your business is, think about how you can create neighborhoods of solutions, um, as my friend Susan over at Sphere Trending calls them. I think it's a great phrase. When you create neighborhoods of solutions, you make shopping easy, and you, you help cross-sell without a hard sell. Increased competition on branded products means even more of, has to be paid attention to to innovate and differentiate the basics because basics business are essentially commodities businesses and so ask yourself what part of this business am I innovating you know what's what's my difference how is 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 branding my difference uh, you know everybody has a can opener do I have a brand that people trust is that how I'm you know uh, differentiating on the basics um, and finally decreasing retailer and brand loyalty continues so have a plan to earn it a lot of brands have, um, Unilever is a great example, they have promotions, they have ways to reward you, uh, you know, but again, whether you're a wholesale or retail, find, have a plan to reward people for coming back and earning their loyalty. Sometimes loyalty is just great product and great innovation and that's quite enough, um, but have a plan for something. The second tenet is listen to the consumer. So, I, I, what we keep saying is, reimagine the consumer the way that they're reimagining themselves. Um, the, 
Younger people are acting older now, a little bit more responsible. Older people aspire to be younger. Um, and what we did was we said, we're always talking about generational differences. Let's talk about generational commonalities. What do all the generations have in common? Because that, ideally, is the biggest market you could have, okay? Health and wellness is obviously probably one of the largest things, especially in our industry right now. They want brands and retailers to give them solutions. Now, Gen X and Gen Y, want proactive solutions. They want things to make choices that make their life easier, that keep them healthy from the get-go. And um, boomers like me want reactive solutions. <laughs> How do I make up for the fact that I smoked for 20 years? Um, you know, all of those little things that, you know, are like, yeah, digging at the back of your mind. How can I make myself healthier? The second one, global stewardship. We talked about that, just expecting brands to help make the world a better place in some way. It might be giving to education. It might be giving to the hungry. It might be developing products that can biodegrade in the landfill. Um, but there has to be some address of that. Acknowledging that there is a common shift in trust from mass media and what brands say about themselves to what consumers say about brands, what consumers say about products. Again, a pivotal point in why social media is important. And if you're not engaged in social media, I say this every year, go online and just Google yourself, Google your shops. Last year we asked how many people, you know, Googled them, themselves in their shops online and about 20% of people raised their hands. Yeah, it's scary. Somebody's going to hate you, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, but... Um, I Googled myself and found out that somebody said, he's a great speaker, but he wears earrings. What does he think he is, a barista? So, <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> so, um, make sure that you understand. Consumers trust consumers. When you can get a consumer to talk about you and say that you're great, you've done a tremendous thing. The good life, redefining the good life in values, in family, in friends, in home, and health. How does your brand bring the good life to the people you serve. Thoughtful consumption, practical buying merged with experiential cur currency. And we'll talk about ex you know, the currency of experience a little bit later. But basically, we buy the idea that we all want to buy products that we need, but what tips the scale when we don't really, really need it is experience. We buy experiences. We buy things that make our life better within, the re within reason. Life balance, products and services that help relieve stress and just sort of lubricate our lives, make things go smoother, faster, give us more time with our family, give us more time with our friends, give us good and fun things to do with them. And then finally, a market of me, products that are so relevant to my lifestyle that I can customize them, I can make them do 10 different things, um, you know, I... Uh, uh, I can make, use them for multiple uses in my life, and then maybe my kid or my parents can use them for something else. The insight survey, we said, does your, this was a really interesting, probably one of the most important questions. Does your company understand and act on the key differences among the generations which are critical to your business success? Only 28% said that they clearly understood that generations made a difference or what difference they made. 72% said they didn't. So, towards that, we're going to give you just a little sort of roll-up. Every year it changes a little bit. Generational divergence. How are the generations different? Well, Gen Y, 20 to 38-year-olds, millennials, they came of age in a bad economy, okay? So they're very financially resourceful. Um, they're very careful with their money. Surprisingly, they're not as good at ferreting out the best price as Gen Xers are, but they are very um, good at it. A lot of it's probably because they don't quite have as much income yet. They're a very self-service generation. They are creators. They love to craft. They love to bake. They love to make. They love to cook. They like to create things. This generation is three times more likely to make a gift for someone than any other generation And when it comes to making versus buying. Um, they have a very communal home style. Stylistically, they like eclectic looks. They like individualistic uh, combinations, and then they are acting older, meaning they're finally starting savings, proactive well-being. In fact, they're starting saving about 20 years younger than boomers did, which I think is amazing. Um, but then they can save some because the, a lot of them are, are still living with their parents um, in the first half. I wasn't saying it to be critical. It's okay. Um, Gen X. So they came of age in a bad economy. They're very practical. They're very pragmatic. 
They, are, they like convenience service. They don't particularly like to pay for service. Um, they are multitaskers. And so they are very good at balancing multiple things. They are a family home. So they're the generation with the most young kids in the home. Style is very peer-inspired. A lot of this generation talks about um, the effects of their... Uh, of other people's style on them. And they are acting responsibly. They're very con focused on living within their means. And then finally, boomers. They came of age in a great economy, so there is an underlying confidence that things will get better. And that really does serve a lot. They're also, they are the full service customer. If they can afford it and they can justify it, they will buy the thing that's a little bit put more put together, has a few less steps, a little bit higher quality. They're curators, um, so they do compare and contrast a lot, tend to try to buy themselves the best that they can afford to buy. They have um, extended family at home, parents moving in with them, some kids moving back in with them. Um, they're stylistically, they're really transitioning to more informal and casual lifestyles, but they're acting a lot younger. The, the great thing... <laughs> You know, I, I have to admit that, that designing or developing product for boomers is, is scary sometimes because you're like, well, if you're telling me they don't have a lot of money in there, they're very debt heavy. The fact is that, they're, that stylistically, they're actually influencing their boomer parents a lot. Um, and the boomers want that lifestyle. They want that freedom. One of the things that boomers hate the most about millennials is that we're not them. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we try to keep like, you know, uh, mimicking them in whatever way we can because we know that they're, they've got a better handle on, frankly, life balance than we have. Um, we asked, which of the following is most important when considering how you engage and serve the Gen Y and millennial consumer? Product design innovation was number one, but again, very well balanced. Product design innovation, price value relationship was very high also. And surprisingly, marketing and packaging was 20%. That's super, super important because like I said, we don't have salespeople anymore and this, this generation is very good at editing very quickly and finding the, the points. In home design, millennials are uh, definitely more adventurous than other generations. 43% of them are, say that finding their style is the most um, sort of difficult challenge for them uh, in terms of home design. And they look for a lot of inspiration on Pinterest and other places. Gen X is more into functional design, a lot of attention to energy efficiency, a lot of attention to resource savings. Um, and then, of course, boomers are much more apt to do mo uh, makeovers, remodels, um, and sort of reinvent the, the space that they're in because, as you'll see in a minute, a lot of boomers are living in homes that they've lived in, in a, for about 10 years. Um, and so... Uh, when we look at millennials, we call them the modern bargain shopper, but something interesting about the way that, that they're reacting with a lot of different industries. They're just not accepting certain solutions that people are offering them. Instead, they're creating their own solutions, like Airbnb uh, for hotels, or Zipcar, so you don't have to really own a car. Uh, rent the runway, so you can keep in fashion without buying fashion. So, you know, the person who finds the way to break out of that, that particular box in housewares is going to do very well for themselves. But looking for those solutions, absolutely challenging, but something to, to think about. Um, when we look at millennials' home attitudes, they have the largest share of home buyers right now, 31%, just overtaking um, uh, Gen X. Boomers are at 30%, Gen X is at 30%, and matures, which is people over 70, are at 9%. They have the largest share of first-time buyers, 76% of first-time buyers in this generation, um, which is terrific. It means that we're finally starting to see some traction here. Um, they want authenticity in their purchases. They really like sites like Etsy. And again, this type of thing, <laughs> Etsy's kind of a, the silent killer because they love... I mean, Etsy's great because you can get small batch types of things. You're dealing with a creator community that is predominantly millennials. Um, and it's wonderful for that, but it lures people away from a lot of products that are more closely monitored by brands. Luckily, the functional technological aspects of what many of us do in Housewares protects us from that, but just something to keep in mind. 
when we look at the design trends that appeal to Gen Y, you can see them here. Pardon me. You know, obviously affordability, storage space, and flex space, spaces that act and live in different ways and can be modular or, or change themselves. You know, and the same thing goes for products. A lot of this reference is, is um, from is real estate-based or, or property-based or home-based. But look at, apply the same thing to product and you'll wind up, you know, in, in a fairly safe place. So let's look at Gen X, 39 to 48 year olds. They are really a great trade-up generation. Um, they're the things that really get them to trade up. Well-being, time savings, personal needs, comfort, style, and safety sort of all balled into one when you can combine those things. They love connectivity. Doesn't come to them quite as easily as it does to millennials, but they're right on the heels. Um, did any of you see the last... Uh, um, Modern Family episode? Raise show of hands. Okay, if you haven't seen it, the whole episode was Claire, mother, talking to her family on, on um, the, the entire episode was shot on iPads and cell phones. So it was brilliantly done, but it was just a, a wonderful, literally a snapshot of the way we communicate and the way that generation is managing their family, their needs, the things that they have to do through these devices that they're holding in their hands. Um, one of the biggest problems right now for Gen X and Gen Y is that, or rather for the electronics industry, is that Gen X and Gen Y aren't buying big TVs like boomers do. They may buy one for the house, but they're not doing the TV in every room thing anymore that was so prevalent at the turn of the millennium because about, I think, 60% of the media consumed by millennials is consumed on, uh, usually on a smartphone, uh, but on, on a combo of a smartphone and a tablet. Um, Gen X, it's important not to ignore them because financially, they are really well positioned. On a per adult basis, they're the number one generation on total net worth dollars right now. Um, now granted, they have higher they have some somewhat higher debt loads, of course. Their, their houses aren't necessarily paid off. But you've got a, a really fertile market here for upgrading. They're careful about how they protect that money. Um, but it's, uh, when you look at the share of total income dollars, look at how close Gen X is to boomers. And those income dollars are just going to climb. They should even out. You should see them uh, probably right neck and neck within the next two years. We also wanted to put this in for you. It just sort of shows you where, um, where spending happens, where peak spending happens. And as you can see, it happens between 35 and 54, okay? So the vast majority of boomers are now heading out of those peak spending years. And it's, important, it's one of the reasons why it's so important to engage millennials and to engage uh, Gen Xers as well. One of the great things, people always complain about, oh, millennials aren't moving out on their own. You know, and they're not moving into their home. Yes, that's true, okay? I want them to be financially solvent, and I want, you know. But the fact of the matter is that they are influencing boomers tremendously. It's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a natural cycle the way it's happening. Yes, they're living at home. They're very, millennials are great friends with their parents. Um, I never wanted to see my parents again after college. I think it took me like three years to even speak to them again. Um, but millennials love their parents. They call their parents their friends, their confidants. And because of that, they, they are influencing them in what to buy, what's cool, what's not. They're a real resource. So they're very good for our industry if we know how to leverage those relationships. Um, Boomers are also in a very changing position. And again, it's a little difficult to look at, but simply put, more middle-aged adults supporting their children. When you look at this chart on the left, all, all told, 48% of adults aged 40 to 59 financially provided either primary support at 27% or some support at 21% for their kids 18 and over. With that support comes engagement, comes the kind of influence that we want to use. So it's important to, to see all of that. Boomers also, you know, Gen Y has size, although it's only 82 million versus boomers 80 million. Um, and um, 
Gen X has a bigger household income, matures, have accumulated wealth, but boomers have all three. Two-thirds of boomers are going to es- have an estimated inheritance of $8.4 trillion. Um, and about, I think, I- I'm trying to remember the figure, but it's, it's somewhere about, I mean, maybe three billion of that has already, or three trillion of that has already happened. But most of them plan to retire in the home that they're in which is terrific for us because it means they're redoing their kitchens, they're redoing their bathrooms. Kitchens and bathrooms are consistently, for all generations of home buyers, the primary focus right now. Um, so 39% plan a major home improvement in the next three years. The top reason, 78% want to increase their home value, 65% want to imp- uh, update their home style because it's been, on average, 15 years since they've done anything with it, and 58%... This, this is a, a um, health issue. Uh, Want to make it easier to manage, to move around in the house, to move certain things downstairs, and so on and so forth. Um, so your toolkit for innovation essentials for listening, just don't cling to perceived notions. You know, um, it's a complex world, and, it, it, and for all generations, price, service, and design have different meanings to each generation. So make sure that you look at that. We also put in a couple of links um, to articles that are just brilliant. Uh, trendwatching.com um, has a top trends for 2015, very lifestyle oriented, really informative, and also JWT's 100 Things to Watch in 2015, another great piece. So you'll get the, the links to this as you get the presentation. The next is deliver. Deliver more value. You know, we talk a lot, every, every year we talk about what is the value equation now for different generations. And uh, it's changed yet again. Um, Matures over 70, value is about price plus quality, which it it has been. Now we're seeing a lot more focus on ease and safety, which is naturally understandable. Um, Boomers, value, price, quality. Design was, you know, something that they've always been pretty attuned to. And again, we're starting to see ease in there as ease, speed, all of these things start... um, getting a little bit more difficult for us, like dexterity, things like that, uh, you know, just time saved, things like that. So ease can be about time savings, it can be about manual uh, savings. Gen X, 39 to 48 year olds, price, quality, design, and experience. Very important to deliver an experience. And one of the reasons is that this is the family generation. They want to buy products that are going to enhance their family time, increase the quality time that they have with their kids, give them interesting things to do with their friends, And then millennials, 20 to 38, price all of the above, basically, um, and compassion, which is where we come into the sustainability, the humanity part of that business. But Probably one of the most interesting developments that's going on across every generation is the evolution of the value of story. Where did it come from? Tell me about the materials. Tell me about the families that made it. Give me some indication of heritage. Give me a story. And story, and sometimes stories are about the way objects work together or the, the assortments that you put together. Story is incredibly important. Um, so, and we'll talk about that a little bit. This was just, uh, I'll, I'll rush past this one. But Time Trade did an interesting survey um, where they spoke to consumers who were shopping at retail, predominantly, uh, I believe, in home products that were a little bit more technical, small electrics and electronics. Um, and basically identified a tremendous amount of sales loss because there weren't educated people on the floor or even people who could just talk to them. You know, so 93% said they couldn't find a person to even help them. 90% said they left without purchasing anything when they can't find the right person. Um, And 93% said they're likely to buy when they're helped by by more when they're helped by a knowledgeable associate. So just something to talk about with your team, to explore your teams and whether or not they're delivering the kind of service that's the right level of service for the type of product that you're selling. We talked about the omni-channel journey, just a little bit more data on that. Uh, The facts, uh, you know, are, are, are pretty well laid out here, but basically... 95% 95% of consumers with very little variance across demogra- age demographics or even um, income demographics say that they frequently shop a retailer's website as well as their store. So not surprising, but it makes it all the more important to have a nice balanced uh, assortment. And also social media is a critical component. You know, we've talked about that before, just more data to support that. 
Delivering is also about design that's on trend. And I think one of the ways that we all feel that the housewares uh, has done a great job is copper's a great example because it was in high-end home fashion and metallics on the runways. And within a year, it was out there on the show floor. Um, you know, KitchenAid took an aggressive position on it. Certainly a lot of people followed. Um, and it was, you know, so copper is now, I, I don't know how many of you went to Ambiente, but it was pervasive there. It's certainly pervasive here. Um, and being able to respond to trends like that, that fashion is the type of thing that keeps the merchandise rolling out the door. Um, so it's important to have a voice in fashion. Um, an interesting house survey that talked about how, how often kitchens were remodeled. The average kitchen was remodeled more than 15 years ago. 25% were more than 30 years ago. And so a lot of uh, their, their respondents, and they, um, I can get you their demographic break if you want, but it's heavy in uh, millennials and Gen Xers, um, and not very heavy in boomers, surprisingly. Um, they want people to be, they want to reinvent their spaces and make them more social. Um, some of the things that that means is, of course, when you create open spaces, you have to have products that are open space worthy, things that look great on your counter. So always, always hold yourselves uh, at retail to presenting a design standard because there is not, we don't have, even Gen Xers are stuck in starter homes still. They're still living in homes that they bought when they thought that they were going to have kids, <laughs> or they had one kid, and now they have two to three kids, and storage is at a premium. Spaces change, things are out all the time, they have to look good. And also, we cook a lot more with friends than we did 10 years ago, so everything has its social place. We also feel that delivering artisanal details is very important, and that can happen in a number of ways. I mean, you see people... Um, uh, some of the new product, even from uh, Libby Glass, for example, uh, the packaging makes it sound artisanal because it's talking about the shape and the fact that the, you know, the shapes are formed to make sure that craft beers taste hit just the right place on your tongue and um, immeasurable amounts of crap. But fascinating. Uh, <laughs> hey, it worked for Riedel, right? Um, so hand craftsmanship... It can mean um, mixed materials. Mixed materials are the language of high end. Um, so always, you know, wherever possible, woods and metals, very important statements. Design heritage, innovation, a heritage of innovation, are, you know, all of that uh, helps to move the ball forward. We also think that we have to deliver healthy environments. And that doesn't just mean healthy foods, healthful foods. Uh, it doesn't just mean actual products. It means the ability to create an environment in which you feel like you're treating yourself better, you're treating your family better. William Sonoma does a brilliant job of it. Um, you know, and, and some of the, the sort of talking points for that whole thing are, you know, buying local, buying fresh, a new emphasis on buying daily, buying more frequently, um, which honestly is, is something that across the world is, is much more common than it is uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, safe, safe storage, storing your food correctly, may, using your leftovers, if not eating them, using them for something else. Um, so that uh, composting and the whole reduce, reuse, recycle. But the, creating a conscious kitchen is not about healthful food, it's about healthful living. Um, we also wanted to talk something about the, uh, well, the integrated kitchen. Um, there's something called the life triangle, which is basically a triangle that's created in the area that's, if you draw a line between the kitchen, the dining area, and the living room. And this life triangle is this actionable space that all of us live in. So the idea behind that is that space is more and more exposed. It's more and more out there. That's the desire. And so knowing that every product you put into that kitchen is visible from the living room. What is that, what is, how does that change the way you develop, the types of products you develop? Um, how does it change the aesthetics? Um, also, bigger isn't better. You know, we were, uh, this was um, something that, um, how, another house survey, that 77% of people, um, um, it said most people don't want a larger kitchen, but they do want a feeling of space. So that means that there's, we're going to be seeing even more islands because islands create that effect. 77% of those people say that their kitchen are going to be open to other rooms, and 61% say that they're going to incorporate an island. We also believe in delivering social experiences. Um, 
IKEA did a home survey. It's actually, you can, you can see it online. It's really interesting. Um, but basically, they said that 45% of consumers say that they spend leisure time in the kitchen. 35% um, send... 35% spend social time, and 11% send hobby time. So the kitchen is, as we've been saying, it's a very social space. Making sure that we address that, give people new ways to look, and create social experiences around things that they like to do. Um, flexibility. Flexibility in product is critical, especially as space, you know, things that get smaller, things that compress, things that multifunction. So you'll see a lot of that. I love this woman. Um, so what do people really want? The value of convenience. Deliver more time. Deliver the... One of the things that we keep seeing coming up in, in all of these surveys is I want to spend less time in the kitchen. Consumer Reports did a survey and found that the average uh, person wants to spend eight minutes less in the kitchen in, uh, uh, in food preparation every day. In food preparation every day. So products that save time are always going to be, you know, just really wonderful. Um, not because it's lifetime, but I really do love this product. These knife sheaths that sharpen the knife every time that you take it out of the sheath. It's a brilliant idea. It's a time saver. It's one less thing that you have to do. So those types of things that really take, you know, uh, quality of life into consideration. The insight survey we asked... Innovation goes beyond product alone. Which best describes your company? And I think what was alarming to us was that of respondents, we had such a high percentage of people that said, 38% said, well, we're innovative in thought, but we're, we're kind of reluctant to make any investment in it. And 42% said, we're occasionally innovative, but we don't have a defined strategy. Take the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say it without sounding preachy, I suppose, but, but taking the time to strategize and not just to let the wave of business being good carry you along, it, it's never about luck. The people who are winning have a strategy to win, um, and, and innovation is, is definitely a part of that. So as the toolbox for that, we came up with what I think is a really hard one. And that is holding yourself to a new standard. So we put together a list of nine things. And the rule that we're asking you to hold yourself to is if you can't, on the next time you're going to put up an assortment together or a new product or a new service, if you can't say that at least two of these points are clear, definable, marketable points, don't do it. The first is, does it save time? Does it save energy? Is it more efficient? The second is, does it save space? Is it more safe? Is it functionally better? More features? Is it more durable? Is it better in design and style? That's something out on the market. And again, this is clearly different. Is it delivering improved experience and improved living experience, improved results? Does it deliver knowledge? Does it deliver new skills? One of the things I love about KitchenAid is they have online support for it, but every new introduction they make seems to deliver new skills, deliver new abilities. Um, does it deliver an ethical advantage? Um, sorry, I just jumped past that. It's, it's a hard list, there's no question, um, but we really believe that if you can't check off a couple of things on here, it's just, it's just an also ran. <laughs> I hear a cricket, I really hope that's somebody's phone. Um, Um, wow. Enable. So enable creativity and experience, one of the last tenets. And that is deliver important knowledge to consumers. Consum the more we cook at home, the more we experience at home, the more all of these things become competitive, the more concerned we are about safety, the more important it is to inform people, to give them knowledge. Um, there are some companies, uh, uh, one comes to mind that's not here. You can find them at... Uh, Bosca.com, B-O-S-C-A. This is a company that is passionate about cheese. They're a company from Holland. And um, they don't just show you their product and how it's made. They tell you everything that you could possibly want to know about cheese. You know, so I love cheese, so it's great for me. But it could be about safety. It could be about anything. Imparting knowledge should be an important part of everything, every product that you put out there. 
Enable a nation of makers. Between millennials and Gen X, the idea of creating and making is very, very strong. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're giving, giving them the tools to prepare things. The trend right now is for simpler foods, cleaner ingredient statements, even in cocktails. Uh, molecular mixology is like way out. Simple drinks, uh, usually three, maybe four ingredients, uh, like mules are a great example. Drinks that we can actually make without having to go to a bar uh, is, are, are, is what's hot right now. So making sure that they have the necessary tools and the best way to use them and constantly improving that experience for them. Also delivering by enabling on-trend food preparation. So we put just a couple of trends up here for you to consider and for you to look over later. Um, but uh, this is via Culinary Visions. Um, so trends in downscale down dining with an up, upscale flavor twist. For example, pub grub, uh, pub foods um, with culinary flair. It's like gastro pub foods. Street food. Street foods tremendously popular right now. And we're starting to seeing a lot of you know great Asian combinations, uh, you know Asian Mexican combination things like that. Peasant food, just these simple, time-honored, slow-cooking, big slow-cooking movement because ingredients are less expensive, it cooks longer, so that whole movement is really amping up. How do we help people with that? What are we doing to tenderize? What are we doing to... And I know a lot of this is about, it, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to sort of talk about this without kind of leaning food prep and things like that, but a lot of things are attendant to that. Even if you look at um, Fuller Brush, if any of you haven't seen the reinvention of Fuller Brush, absolutely brilliant. Um, and they have taken some brushes that you never thought that you'd see again and reinvented them in really terrific qualities. Um, Down-home comfort, comfort foods, grits, bacon, cheese, good, bad for you foods. Um, so um, everything in moderation. And um, finally, kitschy snacks. You know, so a simple treat turns luxe. So gourmet ice cream sandwiches, these little things that you see in the hotel. Um, salted caramel ice cream that comes in a thing like this. It's like a condiment container. I had to buy three of them. Um, but it's ridiculous, you know? Uh, so <laughs> but that type of thing. Um, we also believe that you have to enable entertaining experiences. Always keep an eye on what's going on out there in the world as far as what's hot and entertaining. We put a couple of uh, the Food Channel's top trends uh, for 2015, but uh, Dinner Party Revival was one of them. So what does that mean? And sit with your team and say, what does it mean? How are we enabling dinner parties? How are we going to, if we're, if we're a wholesaler, how are we going to move this concept into a retailer and tell them about this is, you need an end cap of this. You need an end cap that's just about great summer dinner parties or great picnics or whatever those trends are. Always speak to trend. Um, we talk about housewares gifting. Housewares gifting is a tremendous opportunity for growth. And it's very important right now because marriage rates are falling. And marriage rates are not going to climb anytime soon, I'll tell you that. So it's important as, as registries become a less significant driver. Tabletop businesses, housewares businesses, all of these businesses that might normally be registry businesses, we have to start moving into seasonal and occasional experiences so that we're not waiting for somebody to reach marriage age. You're capitalizing on millennials who may still be living at home creating experiences for their family. Um, and also gifting is tremendous amounts of gifting. If any of you were in housewares departments over uh, the uh, third and fourth quarter of this year, there was a tremendous amount of gifting, giftable. And that gi making something giftable is not just about the object itself. It can be about packaging. A lot of housewares products tend to come in really unattractive packages that you think, I could give that to somebody, but I have to find a way to make it look nice. Avoid that problem for the consumer and you address that issue. We believe that we have to enable new food adventures. And we put some examples of, again, from the Center for Culinary Development, of um, how especially millennials love to layer flavors. Um, they love to have adventures. And the fact that they're buying the products, especially food sales in the U.S., is an, as almost a $90 billion business. It's up 40%, 47% since 2008. So... How can we grab onto that? Uh, snacking is another huge business. Right now, there is, right now it's prepared snacks because they're easy. But if we can find an, a way to make our industry respond to regular snacks, then we will uh, you know, do something great with that too. 
the toolkit for enabling is enable creativity, enable new skills, enable knowledge, enable time savings, enable size solutions. It's just sitting down, thinking it out, planning it, and again, sort of holding yourself to a standard that says, am I just putting something else out on the floor, or am I enabling people the lifestyle that they want? Am I enabling their, their passions? And then finally, engage. Engage consumers in new ways. Um, so, <laughs> this was an interesting um, survey that was uh, done by creditcards.com, ironically. And the question was, have you ever made an impulse purchase because you were excited? 50% um, of women and 47% of men said they had made impulse, impulse purchases before because they were excited. Um, I thought that it was funny that bored was number two. Um, and that sad was number three, but with such, like, double the number of women buy because they're sad. So it was, it was strange and fascinating and self-enlightening. I buy like a woman. Um, so <laughs> I do. When I'm sad, I go shopping. It makes me happy. So, um, you know, but look at... Grocery is such a tremendous example of what's happened in the U.S. with creating excitement. Grocery stores, the, the, the big guys, you know, Meyer, Kroger, uh, just tremendous uh, Ahold, have created gourmet departments that are like walking into a Sur La Table. That was their mission. They said, I want people to feel as good as I feel when I go into a Sur. And so I'm, that's what I'm going to create. And now they've just done a terrific job of that. So how are you creating excitement? We also say engage in seasonal excitement. Seasonal businesses, a lot of people have pulled back from them a little bit. As gifting goes up, and it has and it will, seasonal assortments are going to go up too. Look at the number of, um, of uh, ha Halloween numbers. Average 56 guests, median spend 280. Also, engage in, engagement is a lot of times out of ha as, is having a strong point of view, and there's two ways to go with that. The first is channel lines blur. So from a manufacturing standpoint, you may see somebody like, Brabantia saying, okay, we produce waste management products, but people love our brand. So we're going to branch out and do uh, sinkware, cleaning product. You may look at, in terms of retail, you're already seeing channel lines blur. It's like I was talking about uh, gourmet and grocery. The other end of that is to specialize. And a great example is a store in New York called Whisk. There are plenty of them. Every great city has some. But these stores that have said, I'm going to be about serving the baker. And it doesn't mean that it has to be somebody, something small. It can be, I'm a huge retailer, but I'm going to have a section that is just for the baker. So, um, you know, choosing who you want to specialize in. Being, uh, you know, Loblaw's wall of cheese. You know, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of great examples out there. Engage in great service, and this is just, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty much self-explanatory. But great service is engaging. Um, it gets people talking. It gets people talking to each other about you, which we know is incredibly important. Um, this was the alarming stat that I was talking about before, and I apologize. I screwed up the bottom of the slide. Um, and maybe I, There it is. Okay. So how developed is your social media strategy? Only 16% said it was really highly strategized. 64% said it was somewhat strategized but n and not fully executed. Time is running so fast. <laughs> you, it, it's really something worth devoting your time to. Even if you say, we're going to handle it in a minimal way, what's best for our customer, you know, um, there's, uh, there, it's, it's an important thing to address. And as a part of that, we wanted to say, okay, what do millennials expect? I'm not going to read through this for you, but it's just a, it's a list of what millennials expect to be able to do with brands' use of technology. They want to know where your store is. They want to see, be able to compare prices. They want to, you know, um, uh, be able to pay th for things mobily. So it just gives you a list of only things above 40% of what they expect, the top 10 items, um, so that you know that whatever your effort is, is directed towards them correctly. We also wanted to talk a little bit about gaining user content. Five of the top seven resources that Gen Y uses to determine whether they trust a product or a brand is content that's not generated by even the store. It's generated by users of the product. So we put out the list uh, from this survey. 74% uh, 
is conversations with friends and family. 68% is peer reviews and opinions. 64% pro-industry pro industry reviews. 56% email, text, I am with friends and family, usually at or near the time of purchase. 50% social networking and content, 49%. So you'll see all of these things, but again, read it and look at it as you consider how you're, gonna, um, how you're going to take a social media position. Um, it's interesting, because they multitask, Gen Y can consume 18 hours of digital media in a given day. Um, it's really frightening, but it's because they're running between different things, so. Um, and then also we gave you some information on what do, what do consumers most use their mobile phones for when they're in a store. 55% compare prices, I realize this is pretty hard to read. 55% compare prices, 45% um, uh, look up, um, coupons, 52% um, is taking pictures. So it just tells you how people use phones so you can be prepared for that and know what's more important. And then here, our toolkit, we just gave you um, for Innovation Essentials the most important social media sites so that you'll know what, just subscribe to these, you will know the best how-to social media blog for small businesses, the best digital buzz blog, um, the best blog for content strategy, the best facts and figures, uh, you know, and from uh, top-level consultancies, uh, consultancies um, you know, best in-depth articles about igniting excitement. But they're just great resources for you to click on at your leisure with your team, talk about things, and make sure that you're up to date on what's hot and what, what's not, so that you're not standing up here like I was four years ago saying, Pinterest what? <laughs> um, <laughs> and... Um, and then also with digital deliveries, we're going to give you... Um, <laughs> so, simple language like storytelling. There's so much... We just gave you a two-page glossary of essential terms that have to do with social media that was put together by our social media team. Um, they're brilliant. I sat down with them. I said, okay, I've heard seven different definitions of brand storytelling. Tell me what it is. And then we had them just write this all down so that you're all talking about the same thing. <laughs> You know, because there's just so many shared terms. So thank you so much for all of your time. Um, does, uh, we're, uh, we're out of time. I'm a minute and 46 seconds over. But do you have any questions that I cannot answer? <laughs> awesome, my favorite. Um, so listen, we're giving away a um, KitchenAid stand mixer. We're giving away a full Pantone um, cr uh, creative book suite. Uh, and, but the price is you have to put your name and your email address in that bowl over there. You can put a card in, obviously that'd be ideal, but, um, thank you all so much for your time. I hope I'll see you next year and thanks again.